All right, ladies and gentlemen, the proof having been closed, we've now reached that point where we're about to hear the summations of counsel. And following the summations of counsel, I'll instruct you as to the laws, rules, and principles of law that will guide you during your deliberations and in rendering your final verdict or verdicts. Now, it's our law that the defense counsel will make his closing argument, that is, sum up first, and that the district attorney will sum up last. Now, in making their summations, counsel will review the evidence you've heard and seen during the course of the trial and will tell you what they believe the evidence shows or doesn't show. That's the purpose of such summations. Now, if you find that a particular attorney's analysis of the evidence is correct and the evidence is summed up and analyzed by that attorney is accurate, and if you find that the inferences and conclusions which you are asked to draw from the evidence are logical and sensible, then you are free to adopt those inferences, conclusions, and arguments either in whole or in part. On the other hand, if you believe that either counsel's analysis of the facts or view of the evidence which you've been asked to draw from are illogical or not warranted by the evidence, then you may disregard that either in whole or in part and draw your own conclusions from the evidence that you believe to be truthful. Now, please bear in mind, members of the jury, that nothing that counsel may say in their summations is evidence in this case. And indeed, nothing that I will say in my final instructions will be evidence in this case. You've heard the evidence, and you and you alone are the sole and exclusive judges of the facts in this case. All right, we'll now turn to the summation for counsel for the defendant. Go ahead, Chuck. Thank you, Judge. Ms. <coughs> Fitzpatrick, Ms. Garvey, Judge Fahey, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody this morning? Good. I hope everybody enjoyed the Super Bowl last night. It was kind of dull right up until the end, wasn't it? <clears throat> First off, I want to take a moment and just let you know that, as Judge Fahey said, uh, we've had some technical difficulties going on. And so what's going to happen is parts of this, I'm going to do what we call old school, winging it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask your indulgence as I go through some of these things. If it seems like it's a little inartful, well, that's because all this fancy gizmo stuff doesn't seem to be working this morning. So I'm going to do my best. It's kind of going to be like playing a CD on a phonograph. <clears throat> All right, but again, I want to just take a moment and thank you again for being here. Uh, this week, we're closing in on a month. Uh, I don't know about you, but it seems to have, go by, go, have gone by pretty quick for me. Uh, but when I looked at the calendar, I was like, holy cow, we've been here almost a month. And that is a very long time. And it's a very long time for all of you to take time out of your lives. I'm sure you all have very important things to do over the course of this month, but you are all good enough to take the time to come in here, sit down, and hear all this evidence, and sit in judgment on this case. And for that, again, I mean, I want to thank you. I mean, that is just a tremendous burden, and you've all performed admirably. And we've been watching. <clears throat> we've seen that you've all been paying attention to everything that the witnesses have said, the lawyers have said, and the Judge Fahey said. You've given me a great deal of confidence that we picked the right group of people when we went through that voir dire process. Now again, this is my closing argument, where the opening statement is kind of like a road map to show you what we're going to put forth to the jury. The closing argument is kind of what Judge Fahey said. It's my take on the evidence that you've heard. And there's going to be a lot to it. And why is that? Well, we've got a three-week trial. There's a lot of evidence. And I would just say again, Reiterate what Judge Fahey said. What I tell you, that's not evidence. It's not proof. What the lawyers tell you, it's just our own thoughts about what we saw or what we heard. You are the judges of what the proof is. And I'll tell you, throughout this case, you may have thought that, geez, you know, the defense has been awfully quiet. It's been pretty subdued, pretty mellow. And there's a reason why. We're the defense. It's not our obligation to put forth a case, although we did. And the reason why we're quiet is because I like to do things in my closing argument. This is the first chance I get to really not be quiet. And what I'm going to do is talk to you all about the little things, the pieces of this puzzle that were brought out from that witness stand and in the exhibits which you will see and be able to review over the course of this trial. And I will show you why Stacy Castor is not guilty. Now, Judge Fahey is going to charge you on the law. And he's good at it, and I'm not going to do his job for him. 
But I just want to talk to you a little bit about one, one point. Circumstantial evidence. This case is a circumstantial case. And what does that mean? Well, what it means is that nobody's come in here and confessed. Nobody's come in here and said, hey, I saw Ashley do it, or I saw Stacy do it. Circumstantial, meaning the circumstances lead you to make inferences or take you know, your mind and try to figure out what happened. And I think that we talked about this earlier on about uh, up, up around here, we tend to talk about snow. If you look outside or here, you can't see what the weather is outside. We don't know if it's snowing. But if somebody walks through that door and they're covered in snow, it's a fair inference that it's snowing. If somebody walks in and tells you it's snowing, I just came in from outside, but they don't have any snow on them. They're not wet. They don't look like they're cold. Maybe they've been wearing shorts. Something's wrong with that. That's circumstantial evidence. And again, Judge Fahey's going to talk to you at great length and probably even, you'll, you may think, tedious length about the law and about circumstantial evidence. But the bottom line is that in order to find Stacey Castor guilty, you must find that the prosecution's theory regarding that circumstantial evidence is true. And not just true, but proved beyond <clears throat> all reasonable doubt. And not just that, but the prosecution also has to have proved that no other reasonable theory is possible. And they have to prove that also beyond all reasonable doubt. Now, I'll just submit to you before we get into it in detail. Have we heard proof beyond a reasonable doubt about how Ashley had all of those pills and all of that vodka in her system, how it got in there? I submit to you we haven't heard any proof about how it got in there. Have we heard proof beyond a reasonable doubt as to who or how exactly David Castor was poisoned? No, we haven't. And I want you to keep that in mind as I go through some points. Now the first thing, again, this is one of those things I had planned to use the overheads for, so bear with me, I'll do my best. Let's talk about that note. Exhibit 1, Exhibit 1A, the blow up. It seems to be a pretty important piece of evidence in this case. And it is and it isn't. It is because the person who wrote that note is the person who killed David Castor. The person who wrote that note is the person who is guilty. So yes, it is a very important piece of evidence. But it's also not that important. Why is that? Because we don't know who wrote it. Not for sure, not beyond a reasonable doubt, Technical difficulties. <laughs> now, you remember in the opening statements from the prosecution, one of the promises that was made was that this note would be the thing that proves Stacy Castor guilty beyond literally all doubt. He said he didn't have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, he said he would prove it beyond all doubt. Now, I'm not going to ask you to hold him to that promise, but let's take a look at the note itself. One of the reasons why prosecution believes that is because they theorized that the note was written by Stacey Castor in her own words and then dumbed down to make it look like Ashley wrote it. And some of the things they pointed to were the fact that some words in the note are spelled correctly at times, and at other times they're not. As if somebody said, hey, listen, you know what? I've got this note. Got to make it look like it's someone else. Dumb it down a little bit. Well, I'll change this word, and I'll change this word. But they didn't go through it like with, uh, you know, we didn't look at every word. So if they changed, for instance, the word, and this, this is just my own thinking about this. Say they changed the word tree in the note. And the word tree appears maybe a dozen times, but they only really change it once or twice. And the prosecution wants you to believe that that fact means that somebody tried to dumb it down. 
but that's just not so. And how do we know? Let's take a look at Ashley's letters. And remember, you have both, well, you're going to have a very large packet of letters that we know are written by Ashley Wallace. You'll have those to review. And I would suggest and ask that each one of you read all of them in, its, in, in their entirety. And I suppose, I don't know if this is so, but Judge Fahey, I'm sure, will tell us that if you wanted copies of that exhibit, they could be provided for you so that you don't all have to just keep passing it down. But I suggest and I ask that you read them all. Take your time. I'm satisfied with your good judgment on that point. Now, again, we heard from, I'll use the term loosely, my expert, Dr. Roy. And putting aside the fact that Mr. Fitzpatrick's a great lawyer and Dr. Roy is somewhat of a, an aging academic, let's just look at what's actually in that note. So let's talk about those things, that sort of back and forth spelling. And again, I, I put this up on the display, so if you're taking notes, I'll ask you to just sort of make a note about certain page numbers I guess I'll refer you to. And the exhibits, Ashley's letters, are paginated at the top for convenience. The first thing I want you to take a look at is page 4569. And I want you to think about the word think, T-H-I-N-K. On page 4569, you'll see that Ashley uses that word approximately five times. But she only spells it correct four. You'll see that. Ashley doesn't have consistent spelling. Now, think's a pretty simple word, but an even simpler word is the word do, D-O. I'll draw your attention to the letter that starts on page 4570. Ashley uses the word do, D-O, twice, but she only spells it correct once. Same thing with that letter, or I should say with that word do, D-O. She does the same thing on the letter which starts on page 4612. Both DO and DOO appear in the letter. So, for the prosecution to say, and I have some more examples, but without the overhead, it's too difficult, I'll just tell you. You can look in those letters yourself. But, you know, the prosecution tells you that this inconsistency of spelling points at Stacy. But read Ashley's letters. Her spelling isn't consistent. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong just like in the note. So the bottom line is, this inconsistency of spelling tells us nothing. Once again, this important, important piece of evidence doesn't reveal anything about its author. Another point. Ashley has trouble with the word to. T-O versus T-O-O. -O. Now in the note, and again, I can't blow it up for you, but in the note, you can see and read for yourself that T-O and T-O-O -O are used correctly and incorrectly in the note. And you'll see in Ashley's writings the same thing. Again, I'll direct you to a couple of page numbers. Uh, 4569 is a good Chuck, example. Chuck, I think the video is working. The audio is the problem. I think if we turn it on, though, it's going to start banging away. Okay, all right. So, Whatever you uh, it's better safe than sorry. I would think, okay. It's an audio problem, really. And a, you missed out on the horrible noise we all had. So, but I'll draw your attention to page uh, 4569. She writes the phrase, I love you too much, but she writes it T-O. In the same letter, but two pages later on 4571, she writes, going to do the same, or she's going to do the same thing the second time too, but she misspells it, T-O. Now in other places in her writing, she gets it right. If you look at page 4585, she says, I want to get a tattoo that has your name on it, too. But she spells it correctly, T-O-O. -O. Same thing on page 4588. I wish I could get off earlier, too, T-O-O. -O. So the fact that in the note, the word too is used inconsistently, or in inconsistently turns out to be meaningless not evidence of anything. And again, I don't want to sort of beat this whole spelling and grammar thing to death. I think we've already done that, but just read her letters. Read them, and then read Stacy's letters. 
ask yourself, you know, who does, who does this note sound like? Does it sound like Stacy or does it sound like Ashley? Use your common sense, your good judgment. All of you have different life experiences. You've all written letters. You've all read letters. You've all read things other people have written to you. Use your own good judgment. And I'm confident <clears throat> that you'll find that that note, Exhibit 1, sounds a heck of a lot more like Ashley than it does Stacy. But again, I'll draw your attention to a couple of things. Read the letter starting on page 4604. Now this, this particular letter is a very good example of just about everything I've talked about. It's got problems with grammar, punctuation, inconsistent spelling, run-on sentences, lack of capitalization, all of those things. It's a very good letter to read because it just covers the whole gamut of what we're talking about. I won't go any further than that. You've got that page, you'll look at it. Now let's talk about this whole it versus I, as in it did it versus I did it. Mr. Fitzpatrick on cross-examination with Stacy made a very um, forceful, probably the word, argument about Stacy's difficulties in using the words I and it and interchanging them. Now, you know, when I heard that, it sounded pretty convincing to me too, except I'd read all of Ashley's letters. And I knew, I knew, and you'll know when you read them, that Ashley has the same problem in those letters. And I'll draw your attention to it. Take a look at page 4570. She says, I would be so easy to, instead of it would be so easy to. Take a look at page 4598. She makes the same mistake, confusing I and it. So this whole thing about it, it doesn't tell us anything about who wrote that note. Nothing. So once again, what do we have? We have this note, which at first glance appears to be the single most crucial piece of evidence in the case, both for the prosecution and for us. But what does it tell us? Nothing. Nothing. We don't know anything so far about who wrote it. Now look at, let's look at the science of the note, or I should say the, the computer forensics, or the computer science of the note. One of the reasons, and in fact I expect right up until the time Mr. Grant testified, probably the biggest reason why the prosecution promised to prove this case to you beyond all doubt was the computer forensics. And I'm going to get into that a little bit, but just generally, do you remember? The, the argument essentially was that if the actual printed note had that information about Ashley being interviewed by the police at school, and we know when that happened, and if we look at the computer and we can tell, well, hey, when was the last time that Word or one of the word processing software things was used? and then we can see when the last thing, time something was printed, well, if between that time and this time, Ashley wasn't at the computer or couldn't have been at the computer, then we know beyond all doubt that Stacy's guilty. And I submit to you that that is exactly what the prosecution was thinking right up until the time Mr. Grant told you that just wasn't so. So let's talk about what happened. Let's talk a little bit about a computer, how that works. Oh, and by the way, you remember what Mr. Grant said about Mr. Bracken's work? He didn't say that Mr. Bracken was incompetent. He didn't say that he was wrong about what he told you. What he told you was that Mr. Bracken never completed the job. He got to a certain point on 9-12 that, I guess it was in the middle of the afternoon at the exact time escapes me, maybe 2.30, whatever it was, but it was a time when Ashley wasn't there, and he got to that point, he looked at the computer, and then he stopped. He never looked at what happened later on on the 12th, what happened to the computer on the 13th, or the 14th. Now, I don't fault Mr. Bracken, he pretty much did the same thing that every other member of law enforcement did in this case. He started looking at evidence, and once he found something that he thought pointed at Stacy, he stopped, because he said, you know what? Hey, Stacy's the killer. We're not trying to prove who did it. We're trying to prove Stacy did it. 
And that's a grave distinction. That's an important point. And we'll come to that later. But every member of law enforcement made a decision that Stacy Castor was the killer. And all they said about doing was proving she did it. They didn't try to find the killer. So let's get into these computer forensics. What did we learn? Well, one of the things we learned was about files being deleted. And we learned that a file, when it's deleted, it never really goes away. It's not like erasing a chalkboard. That file sort of sticks around. And we use that VCR tape analogy. And all the experts agreed on this particular point. When you have one long show and then you tape over it, but you don't tape the whole thing, still got that poor part of the first show left. Do you remember that? It's, it's a little confusing, a little technical. And so what I suggest is if you have a problem remembering exactly what they said, you know, have the testimony read back. That's why we have court reporters. Make sure you understand it. Now, when something on that VCR tape, you know, when that second show gets put on top of the first show, all the experts agree on a, particular, on a couple of things. One, that whatever that second show was has nothing to do with the first show. It doesn't tell us anything about who was watching that show, who taped it, nothing. It just happens to be random, the computer. Remember they talked about the hard drive sort of whipping around at 100 miles an hour and just starts sticking things all over the place? So the fact that, say, you know, I tape an episode of Lost, and then, you know, say my roommate tap tapes an episode of, oh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a show that's a half hour long, I don't even think of, maybe an episode of Seinfeld, right? The fact that we know that Seinfeld's on top and my roommate taped it, that doesn't tell us anything about who taped Lost. Doesn't. Just means that Lost was there first. That's the one thing that's important, that Lost had to be there first. So, what does that mean? Well, let's put this in context. The computer experts said, and Mr. Grant was very clear about this, that they were, they were going through this computer looking for the note itself, the actual note. And what did they both tell you? Another point they both agreed on. They never found the actual note, Exhibit 1 or 1A, whatever you want to call it. They never found it. What they found were fragments of what appeared to be drafts. And how do we know they're drafts? Because they're very small portions of the actual note. And they're different from the actual note. They are not the same thing. So I want to be clear on this point. The actual printed note is not the same thing as either of those fragments. But <clears throat> there are some things that those fragments can tell us. I'm going to try it again. I'm going to try to do this old school. So The first fragment is that Harvey Black fragment. We call it the Harvey Black fragment. That's because it was attached to a letter written to a Dr. Harvey Black. Now, the fact that it was attached to a letter written to uh, Dr. Harvey Black, what it was attached to, it's meaningless, like I just said. It doesn't mean anything. But if we look at the Harvey Black letter and we see when the last time that was accessed, then we know at least a little something about the file fragment underneath it. Remember when Mr. Grant talked about that light switch? If you walk into a room and the light's on, and, but when you left the room earlier in the day, it was off? Well, it doesn't tell you when the light switch was, went on, but it tells you the light switch had to go on before you got there. So what do we know? So we've got the Harvey Black fragment. And that has a date, 9-11-07. And again, it's in the middle of the afternoon. Or I should say the middle of the afternoon. It's early in the afternoon. And what does that tell us about the fragment underneath? Nothing except that that fragment had to have been written or put on that computer at some point from here all the way back, I won't say the dawn of time, but to the time somebody first turned on that computer when they bought it. Anywhere. Now, of course, we know that the police investigation didn't really start heating up until about September 7th. So we can figure that it was probably written sometime between 9-11 and maybe nine, seven. But where in here? Can't tell. 
So then we look at that second fragment, that word 11 pip file. And that was on the 12th. And that was also early in the afternoon. And what does that tell us? Well, that that fragment had to be sometime all the way back, again, not necessarily the dawn of time, but probably September 7th. Now take a look at this. We don't know anything else about those fragments other than this. Now, this fragment could have been written right here, or here, or here. This one, here, or here, or here, or here. In fact, it's tough to tell at some point, if you go back far enough, where or which ones came first, except for one thing. We know something, or I should say this, it's tough to tell, again, which one came first. But then there's that last thing, is that actual note, right? The note itself, we know that it had to be written after Ashley was spoken to by the police on the 12th. We know this. So we know the note had to be sometime after this and sometime after this. Now why was that so important to the prosecution? Well, because their expert got up there and he told you, well, hey, you know, I looked at this uh, Word 11 PIP file. It's a file that works with Windows and Word. And I looked at it and because of the nature of the file, <laughs> I can tell you with absolute certainty that nothing was written on that computer in Word and nothing was printed off that computer after that date. Now again, if that were true, that would be it for us. I don't even think I'd have to make a closing argument. You wouldn't have, my closing argument might have been something like this. <laughs> you got us. But that's not the case. That's not the case. Because why? because Mr. Bracken didn't finish the job. Now, Mr. Grant got in here, and I'll tell you, out of every witness I saw testify for both the prosecution and the defense, um, many of the witnesses, most of all the experts and the professional witnesses, you know, the toxicologists, um, they were great. They were very credible. But I gotta tell you, I think Mr. Grant was probably the most credible and the most easy to listen to out of all of them. And what did he tell you? He told you this that Windows and a computer is such a complicated thing that you can't say anything 100% unless you're sure 100%. He's told you he's a computer forensics expert. He doesn't make guesses and he doesn't assert theories. And he told you from that witness stand that if he was going to make guesses or theories, he could, he could make guesses or theories which help the prosecution and he could make guesses and theories which help the defense. But he says, you know what, I'm not in the business of guesses because it's not fair. It's not fair to the prosecution, it's not fair to the defense to make guesses because a computer is such a complicated piece of machinery. I mean, think about it. We've all used computers. I mean, just think how complicated it is to, for that thing to work and how many times something goes a little bit wrong and it just things start going crazy. He said that unless he could prove it, he can't, nobody should tell you when this note was printed. And what did he do? Now, remember, I asked Mr. Bracken a couple of questions when I cross-examined him. And one of the things I asked him was, hey, did you run any experiments to see why that Word 11 PIP file wouldn't update properly? Remember what he said, his answer? No. He didn't run those experiments. Why? Because if he had, he would have found exactly what Mr. Grant found out. And Mr. Grant told you that he did run those experiments. And he gave you literally a laundry list of reasons why that Word 11 file won't update. Remember he talked about how the second Tuesday is the one that Windows releases the patches and the computers get turned on and they start downloading all that stuff on their own and they're doing all that stuff behind the scenes. He mentioned that. He mentioned problems with Word itself. If you don't turn it off properly, if Word itself has a mistake. He mentioned if Windows has a problem or if Windows doesn't shut down properly. I mean, how many times have we shut down a computer and it freezes up on us? It's kind of like long lines at the DMV. You just kind of expect it. But the most simple explanation of all he told you is you press the off button. He said that. You press the off button and that Word 11 file doesn't update. Now why is that so important? Well, 
How do we know something happened to that, that make that Word 11 pip file not match up correctly? How do we know? Well, and again, you have to bear with me because I was going to put this on the overhead, but exhibit QQ. Now, again, I wish I could blow it up so you could see it, but if you recall, this was where Mr. Grant showed you the last times that the word processing software was accessed on that computer. And again, what we deal with are really the last times on a computer. We can't, you know, you know what I mean? That's how a computer works. All we can know is really the last time something happens, we go backwards from there. Well, he said to you, and you'll see, and you'll show the work, he's got the work right here, that the last time that Word and WordPad were accessed were on the 14th. <coughs> So what does that tell you? Well, nothing except that Word could have been used at any time from the 14th all the way back to the dawn of time. What else did he tell you? Exhibit RR, right off the caster computer, right here. He talked to you about spool files, and again, the spool files, like those little snapshots of the things that get printed. And he told you how frantic, he used the word frantic. He said that he and the prosecution's expert were frantically looking for the actual spool file of the actual note. Because that would prove conclusively who wrote the note. But unfortunately, nobody could find it because it was gone. And everybody agrees that it's not gone because somebody erased it. It's just how a computer works. It's just gone. But what he was able to do was something Mr. Bracken did not do. He looked at this thing called the file allocation table. And I'm not going to get into mumbo jumbo of it. I barely understand it myself. But what he was able to show, and this is the proof right here, was that a document was printed and spooled up on 9.13 at 9.34. PM. And that means, again, that if a document was printed, if that's the last time a document was printed, all we know is that one document here, but any number of documents printed. Because we can never, all we can do is look at the last possible thing. We don't know. So, we now know that this Word 11 PIP file got screwed up somehow. We know it because something was printed afterwards. And Word and WordPad were accessed later on. We know this. We know this. And so the bottom line for Mr. Grant, what he told you, I asked him point blank. Can you or anybody else tell us when the actual note was written or printed? And what did he say? No. No. Now, remember. <clears throat> If you don't think Grant was credible, ask yourself this question. Where was Mr. Bracken to get back on that witness stand to tell you that Grant was wrong? He didn't get back up and tell you that. Ask yourself this. If Grant was wrong, why didn't the prosecution ask him any questions? I submit to you, they didn't ask him any questions because they knew that Grant was right. And they wanted to get Grant off that stand as fast as possible. Because he took their case from that absolute 100% beyond all doubt, and he took it right down to zero. Because we can't tell anything about that note. So the bottom line is this crucial, all-powerful <coughs> piece of evidence, this note. In the end, what does it mean for us about this in this case? Nothing more than an interesting read. Does not tell us a single thing about who wrote it or when. Oh, and by the way, just in case there's an argument that, hey, suicide note on a computer? That doesn't happen. Do you remember the testimony from the officer who seized the computer from David Castor's residence in 2005? 
Now, we didn't hear any testimony about it because, you know, as Mr. Fitzpatrick said, there was a lot of evidence and some of it wasn't relevant and that probably wasn't relevant. But what that officer did say was the reason why they took that computer. He said, why? Because they were going to look for a suicide note on it. So if you don't take my word for it that suicide notes can end up on a computer, take the officer's word for it. They're the professionals. They know what they're doing. Take their word for it. Suicide notes on a computer. Absolutely possible. More than possible. Now, let's move on a little bit. <clears throat> let's talk about Michael Wallace a little bit. I apologize for jumping around a little bit, but let's talk about Michael Wallace. Now, Stacy is not charged or even accused of having done anything to Michael Wallace. That's important. It's important to remember that. But I think it's pretty clear from the evidence that we've heard in this case that she might as well be, right? I mean, we've heard all this evidence about how Michael Wallace died and how, you know, Stacy looks like the one responsible. We heard that, except there's a problem with the second half of this. Once again, we heard Michael Wallace died and we heard why he died because he had antifreeze in him. Now, we heard about rat poison, but the expert said that the rat poison didn't kill him. The rat poison must have been given to him right before he died because it didn't have any effect on him. They didn't notice any of the symptoms of it. But the antifreeze, they said, yeah, he's, he died from antifreeze poison. We know this. So once again, we have crucial evidence, this antifreeze. Okay? It's crucial, apparently. But guess what? In the end, it doesn't tell us one thing about who did it. Other things do, though. And by the way, we agree with the prosecution that the person who killed Michael Wallace is also the person who killed David Castor. We agree with that 100%. Now, the prosecution wants you to think and say to yourself, hey, geez, you know, Ashley was 12 at the time. And I just am not going to believe, no matter what you say, Mr. Keller, that a 12-year-old could do it. That's what they want. They want you to think emotionally about that. Say, 12-year-old, oh, no way, can't do it. But use your common sense. Use your experience. We know that 12-year-olds, as much as we don't want to think about it or admit it because it's terrible, that they can do terrible things. And again, if you don't believe me, you know, think of any newspaper you've ever read talking about those outlandish stories of children doing terrible things. And if you don't believe that, believe the police. Detective Spinelli, he got up on that witness stand, and the very last question I asked him was, is a child capable of a heinous crime? He said, yes. And I said, is a child even murder? And what did he say? He said, yes. So there's no argument about whether or not a 12-year-old is capable of it. And do you remember during voir dire, I asked questions about whether or not you thought a 12-year-old was capable of murder? And you all promised me, or I should say you all understood, said you understood why I asked the question, and you all promised that you, would, you could believe it was possible. Now again, nobody wants to believe it, but you know what? It happens. It happens. So let's look at the, <clears throat> what happened with Michael Wallace. In the time before Michael Wallace dies, Everybody agrees he's not feeling well. Now, this goes back several weeks, maybe a month, whatever it be. The point is this. We don't know whether he was not feeling well because he was being poisoned or because he was just sick. Now, remember, one of the reasons why we don't know that is because remember what, um, and her name escapes me, but it was, she was from the Poison Control Center, that, uh, that nice toxicologist there. She said that antifreeze isn't one of those things that kind of builds up in your system over time. She said you could, you know, a little bit, later on, a little bit. As long as it keeps passing through your system, you're fine. So it's not one of those things that builds up. So because of that, there's really no way that we know or we can tell whether or not, <clears throat> excuse me, whether or not Michael Wallace was being poisoned back then or whether he just wasn't feeling well. Maybe it's coincidence, maybe it's not. Once again, you know what, guess what, we don't know. But here's some things we do know. <clears throat> in 2001, when Michael died, Ashley was taken to the hospital. And while she was there, the doctors 
made a report. And this is just a small one page of a much larger medical report. It's Exhibit B, Defendant's Exhibit B. And in this, the doctors made a note that Ashley had indicated that <clears throat> came to visit at 1430, found patient snoring on couch. So in 2001, when asked about what was going on with Michael, Ashley says, snoring on the couch. Now, is that what you heard her say a couple weeks ago? I don't think so. Now, in 2007, when I, quest I should say, when I questioned Ashley, she told us that in 2007, she gave a statement to Detective, well, Detective Brogan. And I'll just jump off for a second. She remember when she used the word Detective Val, right? It wasn't the detective or Detective Brogan or Detective Valerie Brogan. It was Detective Val. And again, this tells you something about the attitude that law enforcement had in this case. Right? They made a decision that Stacy was guilty, and that's it. And then what they did, they decided to be friends, Detective Val, friends with Ashley. And you know what? You don't look at your friends with a suspicious eye. But if they had, here's one of the things they would have found. And I'll tell you, <clears throat> Ashley gave this statement to the detective. Remember, think about how she was feeling. She just got out of the hospital. She knew her mother had been arrested. Every person in the world, all these detectives are coming to her saying, poor Ashley, poor Ashley, you're the victim. Your mother did this to you. Your mother did this to your father. Poor Ashley. So what does she do? She feels safe. And she makes a mistake. And then she goes and tells the truth. Probably one of the only true things she did say. How does she describe Michael Wallace the day he died? There she is. She's home alone with him. She describes him <clears throat> as lying on the couch. He looks bloated. He's drooling. He's gasping for air. She asks him if he's OK, and he can't even answer. That's her description. When she speaks to her mother on the phone, what does she say? Did she tell Stacy, hey, daddy's not looking so good. Something's wrong with daddy? No. Daddy's making funny faces at me trying to laugh. Except he can't breathe. And then what happens? Well, as this goes on, and he can't even answer, remember what she described? And I kind of act up. He clutches his chest, he reaches out to Ashley, and then he goes limp. He dies. And what does Ashley do? What does she do? Does she say, oh my god, something's wrong with my father? He's not answering me. He's not talking to me. He's not responding to me. Does she call 911? Does she call her mother back? Does she go to her neighbors and say, hey, something's wrong with my daddy? No. What does she do? She leaves. She goes to school to pick up her sister. She leaves. The last thing Michael Wallace ever saw was Ashley walking out the door. And something else. Let's talk about Gatorade. If you remember, Mr. Fitzpatrick was very animated in questioning Ms. Castor about the word Gatorade appearing in that note. And in fact, I agree that the word Gatorade appearing in that note is very important. Not for the reason they <coughs> said. Here's why. The author of the note says exactly how they poisoned Michael Wallace. They put antifreeze in his Gatorade the day before he died. And remember, toxicologists said somewhere between 12 and 72 hours is what it takes to die from antifreeze poisoning. So we're absolutely within the window. We're absolutely within that window for opportunity. So Gatorade. Now, if you remember, when I asked Ashley if her father had had anything to drink the day before, remember when her and Bree were home the day before? 
when they stayed, you know, they sort of skipped school that day. When I asked her, did your father have anything to drink? And remember, that was the day he also that he was very sick and had thrown up. Did you get him anything to drink? Did you see him drinking anything? What did she say? Water. And I said, you sure about that? Sure it wasn't Gatorade? And what was her answer? No. And then what did I do? Well, <clears throat> well, I pulled out that statement she gave Detective Val in 2007. And remember what that statement said when I asked her about that? It said she remembers Daddy was drinking Gatorade the day before he died. And only when I took that statement and put her own words right in front of her face did she agree and admit that yes, she now remembers Daddy was drinking Gatorade the day before he died. And why is that important? Why so crucial? Because guess what? Everybody agrees Stacy was at work. She wasn't home. How could she know Daddy was drinking Gatorade when she was at work? Only the person who killed Michael Wallace would know that. And only the person who was home, who saw him drinking it, who put that antifreeze in that Gatorade, is the person who would know it. And that person is Ashley Wallace. So yes, Gatorade is important. It's crucial. It shows you that Ashley Wallace had knowledge of that murder that she couldn't possibly have had unless she committed it. It also shows you that Stacy, if she had forged that note, how the hell could she have put that word in there? How would she know? She wasn't home. Let's talk about other pieces of evidence. <clears throat> now, literally, in this case, we have seen and actually, I mean, if we stacked them up, there would literally be a mountain of forensic evidence. But to borrow a quote from Macbeth, I'm not, it's only, in fact, it's the only Shakespeare play I like, but to borrow a quote, it's a lot of sound and fury and it signifies nothing. And that's a fancy way of saying something my grandma would say, which is that you can stack nothing from floor to ceiling and it's still nothing. All this forensic evidence about DNA, fingerprints, toxicology, all of it, what does it do to help us solve this case, solve this mystery? Nothing. But let's talk a little bit about some of these things. <clears throat> toxicology. Well, it proves that Michael and David were killed. They were poisoned. Well, guess what? Nobody disagrees with that. Nobody got in here and said, hey, listen, um, you know, Michael was working on one of those cars and he must have, you know, ingested some antifreeze by accident. Nobody got in here and said, hey, listen, you know what? Uh, David Castor, it looked like a suicide back in 05. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, it's still a suicide. Nobody's getting here and saying that. That toxicology that proves they were murdered doesn't help us solve this mystery whatsoever. Let's talk about fingerprints. Well, we hear that David's fingerprints were on some glasses. Stacy's fingerprints are on the glass. David's DNA is on the glass. Well, big deal. Nobody's arguing that. When Stacy told the cops what happened back in 2005, she told them, hey, I gave him this glass and I gave him this glass and he drank out of it. So guess what? Her fingerprints on the glass doesn't mean a thing. I mean, guess what? Are your fingerprints on your glasses in your house? And another important point. Toxicology believe, toxicologists believe, based upon the blood analysis with David, something they couldn't do with Michael, that they pegged the time of his poisoning sometime in, between the early afternoon of Friday through late, or sorry, well, I call it late Friday night or early Saturday morning, however you want to say it. But there's a window there, okay? So what do we know? Well, guess what? If David was poisoned on Friday, whether or not his fingerprints or DNA are on a glass that had antifreeze on it, guess what that means? Nothing, because that glass was there days later. So what does it tell us? Again, nothing. Now let's talk about this brandy bottle. This brandy bottle, apricot brandy, was you didn't get to see it because I guess it got smashed. But the point is this, that brandy bottle, they say, is proof that Stacy must have staged up that crime scene. And I got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if she did stage that crime scene, boy, I would have hoped she would have done a better job than that, because that's a pretty clumsily staged crime scene. Take a look at it. 
I mean, you say somebody drank antifreeze to kill themselves, and guess what there is? There's a glass with antifreeze in it. You, you wouldn't, wouldn't you think the glass would be empty if somebody tried to kill themselves? And this brandy bottle. Wow, what does that mean? Well, hey, the prosecution wants to think Stacy took this brandy bottle, put it on the dresser, and her fingerprints are on it. Well, yeah, her prints are on it. But guess what? What did she tell Detective Spinelli? She told him the truth. Hey, look, I don't know how it got in there. I certainly didn't put it there. You're telling me my fingerprints on it. Well, you know, I don't know how they got there. There's an old cabinet of a bunch of old liquor in the sink, under the sink, or in the kitchen, or wherever it is. Hey, guess what? How many of us have the same thing? A bunch of old bottles of stuff that we never use or drink. It's just been sitting there for years. And remember what the fingerprint experts told us? Fingerprints don't go away. My fingerprints are there. They're going to be there until the end of time unless somebody wipes them off. So what do our fingerprints on that mean? Nothing. But think of it this way. What does that brandy bottle really mean? Why would Stacy put it there? Well, we know Stacy says that David was drinking Southern Comfort over the weekend, right? She knows that's his drink. So if she's trying to set up a crime scene, fake suicide scene, where it looks like David was getting drunk and then killed himself, why isn't there a bottle of Southern Comfort on the counter? I mean, doesn't that seem to make perfect sense? Why would she take this completely random, nobody knows where it came from, apricot brandy bottle and stick it there? And by the way, if she was so clumsy as to leave her fingerprints on there, why aren't her fingerprints on that turkey baster? And why aren't her fingerprints on the antifreeze jug itself? Because we know they're not. Now think of it this way. Who in that house might not know exactly what David Castor likes to drink as far as alcohol? I wonder who that could be. Who in that house wasn't 21 at the time and so couldn't go down to the liquor store to buy a bottle of Southern Comfort to put on there? Well, Stacy could. She could have gone down there, got another bottle, placed it right on there. And you know what? That perfectly completes that scene. There's David with a bottle of Southern Comfort. He was drunk all weekend. Perfectly completes the scene. So I wonder who. Oh, that's right, Ashley Wallace. Ashley Wallace. Ashley doesn't know what David drinks. Ashley has no way to get a bottle of Southern Comfort if it's not already in the house. Ashley has to work with what she's got. And why aren't her prints on it? She told you in the note. Because in 2005, she used a pair of gloves when she set that up. The apricot brandy bottle, what does it mean? Doesn't mean anything for Stacy. It does mean something for Ashley. Now let's talk about this key. Stacy tells you that over that weekend, David was locking her out of the bedroom. And Ashley comes in here and says, oh, no, uh, there was a, mom had a key. Everybody had the key. Well, um, you can go through the evidence. Ask yourself, did you see a key? Did anybody come in here and say, oh, by the way, here's that key. You know that key everybody had? There it is. Did you see that? Because I sure didn't see it. And consider this. Let's talk about you know, Bree got up on that witness stand, and she said, oh, hey, mom went, got, went to the door, went back, got a key, went back, opened the door, and went in. And so you yourself, geez, why would Bree lie? Well, I'm not going to get up here and tell you Bree's involved in Ashley's wrongdoing. I'm not going to say that to you, okay? Not. Because, frankly, I don't believe it. But I'll tell you what I do believe, and, it, and, I do, and what the evidence showed was that when I asked Ashley questions about her memory, one thing she said was that her memory now, five years later, is better than her memory literally the day that David died. And they took a statement from her. And what did that statement say in 2005? Do you remember I read that portion of it? It says, David locked my mom out of the bedroom and she couldn't get in. That's what she said in 2005 in her affidavit to Detective Lashinsky. Mom was locked out and couldn't get back in. Now suddenly here, years later, four years later, she suddenly has this story about mom having a key. Well, guess what? Where was the key? I haven't seen it. And again, I don't think Bree is in on, you know, Ashley's wrongdoing. But think of this. Who's Bree been living with for the last 16, 17 months? Her sister. 
And at this point, Bree, what does Bree think? Bree thinks the same thing that everybody thinks. Oh, the police come in and say, Bree, you know your mom, she's a horrible monster. She, tried to ki she killed your father. She killed your stepfather. Tried to kill your sister. And they drill that into her head for 16 months. And she's living with Ashley and Ashley's boyfriend. And if you don't think that they talked about this and that Bree wants to try to do right by her sister, come on. And remember her talking about her memory. Anything she said that might be bad for Stacey, she was clear on. Everything else, what did she say? Well, I really don't remember. Well, I'm really not sure. I asked her, hey, when you said this happened on Saturday, could that have been Sunday? She says, yeah, I guess so, because she doesn't really remember. But now, all of a sudden, her memory is better four years later. She, she suddenly remembers the key, which, again, you still haven't seen. Now let's move on to Ashley and the forensics in the Ashley Wallace case. Again, if you thought there was a lot of evidence taken out of David Castor's house back in 2005, you didn't see nothing but compared to what they took out in 2007. A literal mountain. And we heard about a small fraction of what was recovered. And I want to talk about things like the note itself, pill bottles, that bottle of vodka, straws, cans, glasses. Those are the kind of things we heard were taken out of that house among I don't know, probably hundreds if not thousands of other items. So let's talk about the note first. Forensically, what do we know about it? Well, we know that Stacy's fingerprints are on it. Shock and surprise. We heard Stacy on the 911 call talking about the note that she had in her hand while she was on 911. She's never denied handling it. We would expect her fingerprints on it. Who else's fingerprints do we know are on it? Bree's fingerprints. Why do we know that? Well. Because they're there, and because Bree says, hey, I handled the note when I found it and gave it, to, <clears throat> and gave it away. And she also handled it later on when they're in the living room. And the officer had to take it away from her. So the fact that Stacy's prints on it, guess what they tell us? Nothing. Nothing. Now, the prosecution would have you believe that the absence of Ashley's prints on it means something. But now remember, when the fingerprint expert was up here, we had to talk about prints, and we talked about something called ridge detail. Remember, he and I sort of, we weren't arguing about it, but we just want to try to clarify terms. Ridge detail and fingerprints are not the same thing. A fingerprint's kind of like a forensic technical term. Fingerprint's something you can lift and something you can identify. Ridge detail means that you can see, you know, that, that stuff that's on your finger, those, that ridge detail, you can see that, so you know somebody touched it, but you either can't lift it or you can't compare it because it's not enough of it. And what do we know? Well, that there were at least... 15 sets of ridge detail on that note. So the fact that Ashley's, note, Ashley's fingerprints weren't clearly found on it means nothing. Because who, did the, who does all that ridge detail belong to? Well, probably some of it belongs to Mike Oxter. Maybe, maybe the police officer who handled it. Ashley. The point is, again, we have evidence, this forensic evidence, we have it. But what does it help us with? Nothing. It doesn't tell us anything. And the same thing <clears throat> with that vodka bottle. Now remember, when Detective Brogan testified, she described it as pristine. And I'm going to take a stab at this, but when she described it as pristine, her implication was that somebody had wiped it down. But guess what? Fingerprint expert said that although he didn't recover any prints, hey, there's ridge detail on it. If you don't believe me, ask to have his testimony read right back. And guess what? Is that a shock? No. Because guess what? <laughs> Bree found the Hebs loot bottle, hands it to her mom, who puts it on the counter. So the fact that there's ridge detail on it, it's not surprising. The, ab the, the total absence of it might be, but not even that. Because remember what the fingerprint expert said? He said fingerprints, you know, it's hit or miss. Sometimes you can touch something perfectly, you leave a great print, sometimes not. Depends on the surface, sometimes the individual. Sometimes people don't leave very good prints. Let's talk about those pill bottles. We've got a lot of pill bottles, a whole lot of ridge detail all over them. But one thing we do know was that they did recover Ashley's print and they were able to match it off of a bottle of Lexapro. Now, 
you remember when Ashley testified and I was asking her about uh, drugs in the house? And she literally, she almost had a pharmacist knowledge of what this, hydrocodone looks like this, and Tylenol codeine looks like this, and Ambien looks like this, and Motrin looks like this. Well, what did she say she'd never heard of and didn't know about? Lexapro. So why are her prints on it? Because she touched it when she opened it up and took those pills out that night. Now the prosecution, I suspect, is going to say to you, hey, you know what? I'll tell you why Ashley's prints are there. Because Stacy, when her daughter was unconscious, took that pill bottle and put them on there. Come on. Come on. If you were the killer and you were trying to get through this, what's the first thing you'd want to put the prints on? Pill bottle? No, the note. And if you're going to put prints on one bottle, why not put them on? Why stop? Why not put them on all of them? Why not put them on the vodka bottle? And especially the note. Why? Because Stacy didn't do it. That's why. Ashley's prints are there because she took those pills. And yes, let's talk about this second bottle of Lexapro, the one found under mysterious circumstances the, later on. The one from the closet that had Excedrin in it. Excedrin. What did the experts tell you is an Excedrin? Aspirin. And you know what? It was a, there was a graveyard mix of medicines in Ashley the day afterwards. But do you, remember the, do you remember one thing that wasn't there? Aspirin. There was no aspirin in her system. This second pill bottle under mysterious circumstances. You ever hear the words red herring, smoke screen? It's nothing. It means nothing. And, and not just for the prosecution, but for the defense. Because look at it this way. Look at it logically. Okay? Think of it this way. Let's assume Stacy's a murderer. And she tried to poison her daughter that night. Right? Why did she take a bottle of Lexapro and put it back in the closet instead of leaving it with all the other pill bottles right by the floor? I mean, what sense could that possibly make? Why? Why? And then, okay, since we know there's no Excedrin in Ashley's system, why did she suddenly go and find Excedrin from somewhere? And by the way, we never heard about any pill bottles of Excedrin recovered. Why did she suddenly pull out some Excedrin? Maybe I guess she has them in her pocket, sticks them in there, and throws it in the closet. Why? There's no reason. But for the same token, if we say, okay, hey, we believe Keller. Ashley's the killer. Ashley tried to kill herself. Why does Ashley do the same thing? Why, when she's trying to kill herself, does she take this one bottle? <laughs> oh, hey, look, I'm killing myself. You know what? I, I, I can't get all these away. I'm going to put this one bottle away. And before I do, I'm going to take some Excedrin I have in my pocket, put it away. Makes no sense. No matter how you slice that up for the prosecution or the defense, that Excedrin bottle, or I should say that Lexpro with Excedrin in it, it means nothing. Nothing. It's a distraction. And it's even more so because the prosecution played you that phone call where Stacy said, hey, you know, Mike Oxner said, hey, don't show it to anybody. Mike's, Mike Oxner said, well, accept the lawyer. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Guess what? If you were in jail for something you didn't do, would you trust the police? Who would you trust? Probably your lawyer, right? I mean, you, you wouldn't say, hey, listen, get the police over there. These people who have, you know, no matter what I say, are going to think I'm guilty. What are you going to say? Call the lawyer. And that's what happened. And another curious thing about that is remember, what did Stacy tell you about that phone call? It's what, it's 25, 30 minutes long. Why didn't we hear the rest of that? Why not? Why did we stop right there? Why? Because they want you to do the same thing that the police have done throughout this whole investigation. Look at something, take it out of context, and then just assume it's proof of her guilt. Don't do that. Now let's talk about this whole 
Oh, let's talk about some more forensic evidence. If you remember, Ashley talked about that whole story about, um, um, well, Wednesday was the Smirnoff watermelon night, and that's when Stacy tried to poison her with Smirnoff watermelon, allegedly. And then Thursday, we get the even more horrible drink of absolute and orange juice. But you remember? Have you seen any glasses that were brought in here that had any kind of residue from any kind of drugs in them? Because I sure haven't seen them. What about the straw that Ashley so vividly described using to drink that horrible drink? Well, you remember on our case, we called a single detective, Detective Naughton. And when we said, hey, defense calls Detective Naughton, you must have been thinking, why, why are they calling Detective? Because Detective Naughton collected straws from the very room Ashley says her mom gave her that drink and that she used that straw. Where's the DNA testing on the straw? Where's the toxicology on those straws? Where is it? Why isn't it here? Because nobody wants to know. Because the answers might be frightening for the prosecution. And what about DNA on that absolute bottle? And what about DNA on those pill bottles? You heard <clears throat> Ms. Hum from the Forensic Science Lab say that, hey, she swabbed the vodka bottle. She swabbed a bunch of things, but never tested them. So they have it. They've collected it. But they've never tested it. If Ashley's DNA was found on the mouth of that vodka bottle, guess what? That would probably go a long way toward telling us what had happened. If Ashley's DNA was found on the mouth of those pill bottles, that would go a long way towards telling us what happened, wouldn't it? But we don't have those tests. Why? Because they're too afraid to look. Because they've already made their decision. Let's talk about this investigation as a whole. From the very beginning, police said, Stacy's guilty. That's it. Let's see if we can prove it. Now, I submit to you, that's not how an investigation gets run. All right? An investigation should be, we take a look at everything. And if we get a lead that points at Stacy, absolutely, go run it down. If we get a lead that says David Castor actually was suicidal, go run it down. If we get a lead that says, hey, Ashley Wallace might have had a problem with David, a reason to kill him, run that down. Did you hear any testimony about any part of this investigation other than they were after Stacy Castor? No. You did hear one thing, though. <coughs> when I asked Detective Spinelli, I said, hey, Detective Spinelli, did you ever hear information from other, you know, the rest of your staff? You know, he was the lead detective. Did, did any of the other detectives tell you, uh, maybe give you a lead that might have pointed at Ashley? And what did he say? Uh, I don't know. He's the lead detective in the biggest case of his life, and he doesn't know. Luckily for us, Detective Lashinsky testified, and what did she tell you? She talked to friends and family of David Castor, and what did she say? She get developed a lead, and one of those leads pointed at Ashley. Did you hear anything about the police talking to Ashley's friends to try to either rule out or include Ashley? No, because they never did it. When I asked Detective Spinelli, hey, Detective, did you know about these big problems Ashley had with David? He says, yeah, I heard about them. I said, what'd you do with that? Who'd you talk to about that? What did he say? He talked to Ashley Wallace. He didn't talk to anyone else about it. They didn't talk to her boyfriends. They didn't talk to her friends. They didn't wiretap her phone. Why? He made up his mind, and he ignores it. Now, let's talk about Detective Spinelli. Let's talk about how good his investigation was. He gets up there on that witness stand and has the audacity, the audacity to point a finger at Stacey Castor because, you know, she gives a statement in 2005, a day or two after this incident, and then two years later, some of the details aren't exactly the same as in her written affidavit. And now, typically, I wouldn't accuse the, I wouldn't point at a cop and say, hey, the audacity. My whole family's cops. But I'm pointing the finger at him. Why? Because remember what he told you about that, that one particular thing where, when David fell down 
on Saturday, and he had a problem because in 2005 in the affidavit, which by the way, Stacy never got a copy of, which he did have, in 2005, Stacy describes it a little bit differently. She has the order of events a little bit off. Now, why do I say he's got the audacity to point the finger at her because of that? Remember what happened to him in the grand jury? Remember what he testified? When he was in the grand jury talking about the exact same thing, he screwed it up. And he screwed it up so bad, he told you they had to stop the presentation and he had to go back and get his report. Now, I'll, I'll submit to you this. Do you think that he didn't have his report before he went into the grand jury? Do you think he knew he wasn't, do you think he didn't know he was going to go testify? What, do you think it was like a birthday surprise? Surprise, detective, coming to the grand jury. No. He's a trained professional. And this is a couple of months later with written reports. And he's trained, and he can't keep it straight. And he points a finger at Stacy because two years later, with no written report whatsoever, in the context of an interrogation, she mixes up a couple of details? Outrageous. And not only that, Detective Spinelli, I asked him, during the course of hearings in this case, how many times, or I should say, would it surprise you to know that during the course of hearings, when you were asked questions about this case, 32 times he had to say, I don't know, and go look at his reports. 32 times. And this is a detective who has all the reports. And if you don't think he read them before he came in to testify at that hearing, I don't know what to tell you. So we have a detective who's pointing the finger at Stacy because she can't keep a small detail correct. And yet, he doesn't know anything about this case. I asked him, now you remember, we know that antifreeze bottle they found with David, we know there was a print on it, palm print, but we know it was not Stacy's. We know that, okay? But I asked him a question, hey, do you know whose palm print it was? Do you know, what did he say? Um, do you know whether it was Stacy's? What did he say? I don't know. How can he not know? How can he not know in the biggest murder investigation of his career? Whose fingerprints are on what? How does he not know this? I asked him about, hey, did you test this? Did you examine this? What were the results? I don't know. How can he not know what the results are? He's the lead detective. And we're supposed to trust his word? Oh, and by the way, the same detective who during that huge interview, that interrogation with Stacy, what did he tell you? He didn't take any notes. And we're supposed to trust his recollections? Not only that, but you remember about those phone calls? Hey, when did you make this phone call? Where did you make it from? Do you remember what he said? Mr. Fitzpatrick asked him right away. He said, hey, listen, you know, when you were talking to Stacy about the phone calls and you said that, you know, I had proof that they were from the business but not from here, he screwed it up when he was interviewing Stacy. When he was interrogating her, he screwed it up. And so now he's, you can picture it. He's pounding his fist. Ms. Castor, Ms. Castor, I have the records that prove you wrong. And guess what? He screwed it up. He had it wrong. This 911 call. How absurd is this? This whole debate about whether she made this 911 call from the business, which by the way is five minutes away, or from the house. Well, Detective Spinelli would have you believe that this is a huge deal. Huge. But guess what? Take a look at Stacy's statement that Detective Lashinsky took from her in 2005. The one where he claimed, she says, she made the 911 call from home. See if you can find it in there. Take your time to look for it, but don't spend too much time on it because it's not in there. It's not in there. We do have the 911 call. And guess what Stacy says on the 911 call? She's at the office. I'll be there in five minutes. When the detective, or I should say, when the officers arrive, Seven minutes later, guess where Stacy is? Exactly where she said she'd be. Now, if you say to yourself, okay, Keller, I'm not going to believe the detective, I'm not going to believe Stacy, fine. Use, your, use logic. Think about it logically. And again, this is something I'll ask you to do about almost every piece of evidence in this case. Look at it logically. Say, hey, does this make sense if Stacy did it? Does this not make sense if Stacy did it? So let's look at that 911 call. Why 
Why? If Stacy was the killer, would she lie about where she made the 911 phone call from? To what end? What purpose could that possibly serve to lie about it? None. Okay, so she's at home. And she says she's at the business. Why? Why not just say you're at home? But door's locked. She can't get in. What difference does it make? In fact, it's probably a better story to say she's calling from home. Why didn't she use the better story? Because it wasn't a story. She was telling the truth. And more about these phone calls. You know, you heard Stacy talk about that, in, in, that interrogation. You know, did you call this many times? Was it an hour? Was it 45? Was it half hour? Detectives jumping all over the place. She does her best to try to answer them. But again, we're talking about two years later. Do any of us know how many phone calls you made last Tuesday? I don't. And Stacy doesn't have her statement. But let's think about this. What about those phone records you say? Well, huh, guess what? And, and frankly, I can't believe Detective Spinelli doesn't know this. We heard about the cell phone records, right? I'm sure probably almost every one of you has a cell phone. We all know this. If nobody picks up, you don't get billed for it. And if you don't get billed for it, it doesn't show up. The cell phone guy, the guy from the business, I don't know if it was Verizon or Sprint or whoever he was, he told you that what he showed you was a billing record. And I asked him, if nobody picks up, do you get billed? And what did he say? No. So once again, we have a piece of evidence, which looks like it's very important. But in the end, when we actually look at it, with a close eye, it means nothing. Now, frankly, I, you know, I wish I was surprised, or I wish I could say I'm surprised that Detective Spinelli doesn't know how a cell phone bill works. But frankly, I'm not that surprised after what I heard him say. And let's talk a little bit about that interrogation. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Can you imagine? Hour after hour, alone in a room. And this isn't one of those sort of nice, make it pleasant rooms. This is the classic cop interrogation room. Metal desk and chairs, that window. Remember she described the window? Sitting there. And how does she say, describes Detective Spinelli's behavior? Sometimes he would speak quietly. Sometimes he'd shout. He'd talk slow, fast. He'd get close to her. He'd move back. He'd pace. He'd walk all over the place. Now, if you're having trouble picturing it, I'm going to help you out. Do you remember when Stacy was on the witness stand and Mr. Fitzpatrick was asking her questions? Do you remember how that was like, what that was like? Do you remember? That's in a courtroom with a jury, a judge, and a defense attorney. Can you imagine what that was like for Stacy with that detective behind closed doors? with nobody. Can you imagine? If it's that bad in front of you, how bad could it be? How bad was it all alone? And remember, we've heard about wiretaps. We've heard about, remember I asked the detective about long range photographs. They put a camera on the telephone pole outside our house. They, they put a wire at the grave site. They were following her around. But you know what they didn't do? They didn't record their interrogation. Why not? What don't they want you to see? Because you know this whole question about anti-free and anti-freeze? Guess what? We wouldn't have a question about it if they recorded it, would we? But they didn't. So we don't know what happened. But look at this. Detective Spinelli says, in a nice, calm, Detective Spinelli voice. You know, I'm talking to her. I've got this picture. I'm pointing at this, and I'm showing this. And I asked her, you know, what did she pour this? And she said, she poured the anti-free. As if that's how she talks. Hey, you know what? Something's wrong with my radiator. I need some more anti-free. Now, come on. Come on. You heard her on the witness stand. She's very articulate. She's a legal secretary. Do you really think she doesn't know the word anti-freeze? 
And let's talk about that word, <coughs> how she, why she would say it anyway. I'm sure many of you have heard this game, and you can, you know, maybe if you haven't, you can go home and play with your kid. Milk, 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 what does a cow drink? What does everybody say quick? Milk. But then you think about, wait, no, a cow doesn't drink milk. A cow drinks water. It's a trick. It's a game. An interrogation is a trick. It's a game. That's why they don't record it. He shouts at her. He's yelling at her. He's pointing at a glass of what? Antifreeze. And so what does she say? She says what he's pointing at. Why? Because guess what? Listen, I got to tell you, I'm standing up in front of you folks, and I, I don't know how many times I've done this, but I got to tell you, I'm pretty nervous. Maybe some of you are nervous sitting there. Can you imagine what it's like in an interrogation? How nervous? And the fact that you, 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 you say the wrong thing once, and now you go to prison for the rest of your life? Is that where we are? And, by the, and again, they didn't record it. Why not? Oh, but wait. Detective Brogan testified. She was watching through the glass. Almost forgot. What did she say? Well, she didn't say the same thing Detective Spinelli said, did she? She said that Stacy Hughes said the word anti-free. Caught herself. Caught herself. <coughs> and then continued on. Caught herself. Did Detective Spinelli tell you that she caught herself? No. In fact, he made it very clear that she didn't catch herself. So now we have two detectives. You know, apparently they didn't get together and figure this out. Because one of them says one thing, the other says the other thing. And again, who are we to believe? I don't know. If we had a tape, if it was recorded, we would know. But it wasn't. Once again, a piece of this investigation, a piece of this puzzle is denied you. And I'll submit to you this. The reason why that word anti-free suddenly became so important to Detective Spinelli, why he would say that Stacy would use it in common parlance, is because guess what shows up in the note? By coincidence, the word anti-free. But guess what? If Stacy uses the word anti-free and that's how she talks, why in the note fragment does it say anti-freeze? Take a look at the note fragment. It doesn't say anti-free. It says anti-freeze. <coughs> so why would Stacy take a word and then change it to something she allegedly uses in common parlance, which is going to point a finger right at her? Why would she do that? Once again, if Stacy's the killer, something doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. But Ashley who can't spell the same word correctly two times in a row. That makes sense. Read her letters. Read her letters. Now, again, the police didn't do their job. I asked detective, well, in fact, I think I asked every detective, hey, did you know that uh, Ashley actually was suicidal? And what did they say? No. They don't even know it today. Today, we're 17 months after an arrest has been made. And they still don't know that Ashley actually was suicidal. That's a great investigation, isn't it? I mean, they're her friend. Detective Val is Ashley's friend. But apparently, she didn't feel the friendship was close enough to confide in her that she had actually thought about and possibly even tried to commit suicide previously. Why? Because that's a secret Ashley doesn't want anybody to know. Luckily for you, we were able to find her letters. Prosecution found those letters too. But we were able to find those letters. Lucky for us. Now can you imagine, and again, let's talk about some of these inconsistencies. Can you imagine what Detective Spinelli would have had to say if he had actually done to Ashley what he did to Stacy? I mean, Stacy mixes up a small detail from two years difference. Ashley tells this story about a single drink and she's a 0.14 17 hours later. Can you imagine what that detective would have said about that inconsistency? Ashley talks about these horrible drinks 
that she just chugs down. Can you imagine what Detective Spinelli might have said about that? Why are you drinking these things that are so horrible? She's not an infant, she's 20 years old. And what does she do after she gets done drinking the first horrible one? She goes back and gets more. Does that sound like an inconsistency that Detective Spinelli should have looked at? Sounds like one to me. But did he? No. Did Detective Brogan? No. Why? Because they don't want to know the answers to those questions. They've already made up their mind, and that's it. There is absolutely nothing impartial about this investigation. Nothing. Now let's talk about what Stacy had to say. Stacy took that witness stand. You heard from her own mouth what she had to say. And as Judge Fahey told you at the beginning of this case, guess what? She didn't have to get up on that witness stand. And in fact, after Dr. Grant testified, or I should say Mr. Grant testified about those computer forensics, there wasn't any real need for her to testify. But she did. Why? Why did she put herself through that cross-examination, which she knew was coming? Why? Because she wanted to get up there and look you good people in the eye and tell you the truth, that she didn't do it. She didn't do it. And what else did she tell you? <clears throat> she told you that Michael was the love of her life and she misses him every day. She told you about how she wore her ring for more than a year afterwards. <clears throat> so now ask yourself, why would that person kill Michael Wallace? Did we hear any testimony about vi domestic violence? No. We didn't really even have any testimony about arguments, let alone domestic violence. You know, the prosecution suggests to you that the insurance policy is the motive. Well, okay. That insurance policy that was around for 10 years, that she got through her work, that covered the whole family, that minimal insurance policy, that's why? Are you kidding me? And where did that money go? Take 50,000 bucks. Let's assume, let's not even count taxes. Let's just take 50,000. How much is a funeral? 10 grand? How much is a headstone? How much are plots? How much is left after that? And you pay bills. Not much. And then what did she do with what was left? Almost a year later, she takes the kids on a vacation to make them feel better. Is that why she killed Michael Wallace? So she could take the kids on a vacation a year later? Does that make any sense? There's no motive to kill Michael Wallace. And here's the thing. If Stacy was so keen to kill Michael Wallace and she had this whole thing about the, remember the autopsy, who said it, who didn't say it, remember that? <clears throat> well, look. Let's just think about this logically. Who makes the determination of the cause of death? I mean, if one of our relatives or somebody close, God forbid, some, had something happen to them, you went to the hospital. Do you think the doctors would say, hey, what's the cause of death? I want to put it on the certificate. You don't do it. She doesn't say it. That whole thing about a heart attack, that's from the doctors. Do you think for one second that if the doctors thought there was foul play, they would say, oh, yeah, heart attack. Do you think for one second if the doctors thought there was foul play that there wouldn't have been an autopsy regardless of what she said? And if the doctors, the people who worked on Michael Wallace to try to bring him back didn't think there was any foul play going on, why would she? And remember, we heard testimony, Michael's own mother didn't want an autopsy. And by the way, let's look at this logically again. Hey. Stacy doesn't want to be caught, right? I mean, if she's the killer, she doesn't want to be caught, so hey, no autopsy. Where's the cremation? Why'd, why'd, they, why'd they bury him? If he was cremated, that would have been it. But that didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? Because she didn't kill him. She had no reason to try to hide the evidence. Let's talk about David. She told you how she loved David too, but it was a little bit different relationship because Michael was the father of her children. David was not. And you heard about some of the arguments they would have because of that. <clears throat> and you heard that sometimes these arguments are more and sometimes we're a little bit less. <coughs> Say this for me, I'll come back. 
but that they really weren't anything more than standard married people arguing. So why did she kill David? Oh, that's right, the life insurance. Oh, that's right, the minimal life insurance policy that David had on himself because he had to because of a divorce, whereas ex-wife was the first one to benefit from it. Oh, that's right, that life insurance policy. Oh, but wait, the business. That's right, she killed him because she wanted his business. Oh, oh, but wait, what happened after he died? The business died with him. The business shut up. Nobody sold that business. You never heard a witness come in and say, hey, listen, you know, I purchased the uh, Liverpool heating business. I purchased its name and whatever else you buy with the business. And I purchased it for half a million dollars. You never heard it because it didn't happen. Look at the business's taxes. Take a look at them. If you take a look at the tax returns, and again, I'm not an accountant. Maybe, maybe, you're, maybe you're not an accountant, but I can at least read them. The business, take a look at it. See if it made, how much money it made. The last year, that 2004, 2005 year, lost money. Now the prosecution is probably going to tell you, hey, business loses money is a good thing. You pay less in taxes. That means David made more money. But take a look at the math. Take a look at the numbers. Okay. Take a look at how much income the business had and then knock out how much he had to actually pay out. And this depreciation stuff, it's like a ghost. You don't really actually pay out depreciation. Depreciation just happens. So take the amount of money that the business had and then you take out expenses. And you'll see that in 2004, he was left with $25,000 of profit plus his officer compensation for a total of what? 45,000 bucks. And in 2003, he made 6,000 on top of his compensation of 10,000. So 16,000. Okay, so now we have motive to kill D Michael or to kill David, take over his business where David made $16,000 one year and then the year after that he made 45. That's a motive to kill him? Are you kidding me? And look what happened afterwards. You heard from the lawyer, Norm Kirko. You heard from Stacy what happened. Michael dies, and now this business is just hanging out there. And it's just incurring debt. It's not making any money because nobody works there. Stacy has to go on unemployment because there is no more business. So that's her plan. Kill David, wait out two years for the estate to probate, all the while having to sit back on unemployment while the business is racking up debts. And you remember what Norm Churko, the lawyer, said? He said the estate was a mess. The business had debts, judgments against it, owed the IRS, all that. That's the grand plan. Now, yes, did she get some insurance? Sure. Did she get something that was left over from that business? Absolutely. But what did she do with it? She told you that she gave away some of it to David's son. She gave him money and gave him a car. Why? Because she thought that would be David's wishes. Does that sound like a money-grubbing gold digger who's going to murder somebody for every last penny? Doesn't sound like it to me. And that brings us to the will. Look, Stacy got up there and she told you what happened. Did she put his signature on that will? Yes, she did. Is that wrong? Absolutely. Absolutely. Does that mean she murdered him? No, it does not. It is a far cry from putting a signature on a will to murdering somebody. And by the way, if it was her plan to murder him and take all his money, why didn't she get his signature on that will before he died? Why did she wait, what, four to six weeks later to stick a signature on it? Why didn't she have it ready to go right away? Why? She told you why. Because after David died, there wasn't any more money. There was no income. There was a mortgage to pay. The business was still incurring debt. All she had was unemployment. She has two children to take care of. And so did she do something wrong? Yes. In an act of desperation, she did something wrong and she put his signature on it. Did she kill him for his money? No.
Now you ask yourself, you may be asking, well, hey, Mr. Keller, why, what's Ashley's motive to kill David? What's Ashley's motive to kill Michael? Well, I submit to you this. Read Exhibit 1. Read Exhibit 1. It tells you exactly what her reasons were. Now, we can debate all day long whether they're good reasons or not. But she tells you why. <clears throat> and by the way, maybe if the police had actually done their job and followed up on the Ashley side of things, looked into those suicide attempts, looked into the problems she had with David Castor, maybe we'd know a little bit more. Maybe we'd be able to understand a little bit better. But let's ask some more questions about that weekend with David and Stacy. If Stacy's trying to murder David, if that's her plan, why does she keep calling people for help? I mean, me, if I'm going to murder somebody like that, I'm going to isolate them. I'm going to keep everybody away. I'm going to make sure there's no chance somebody's going to come and rescue them. Does Stacy do that? No. Now, she calls on Saturday Michael Coleman, or she calls Danny Coleman, who sends Michael Coleman over to help out. Why? <laughs> she wants help. And Michael Coleman, the prosecution, called him as a witness, asked him a question. What did you say? And he said, or I should say, what did Stacy say? And Michael Coleman told you. Stacy said, should we get him some help? Should we call an ambulance? And what did Michael Coleman say? He said, no. Michael Coleman just thought he was drunk. Because you know why? Because who thinks somebody's dying of antifreeze poisoning? Remember the symptoms. They're identical to intoxication. And as they get worse, they resemble severe intoxication. Why would Michael Coleman lie about that? What reason does he have to lie about it? He's not Stacy's friend. He's a friend of Stacy's wife. Or I should say, he's, a, he's the husband of Stacy's friend. He's not her friend. In fact, he was David's friend. Do you remember? He said that he and David, they went, you know, the, everybody went on vacation together. He said he and David used to go drinking together, go snowmobiling. He's David's friend. Why would Mike Coleman come in here and lie to help Stacy murder his friend? Why? The answer is he wouldn't. And he didn't. He told you the truth. And if he's telling the truth, why is Stacy trying to murder David, bringing other people to that house to help? Are you telling me that's her plan? Hey, listen, you know what? I'm going to make it really look good. I'm going to call people up for help. When they get over there, I'm going to say, hey, should we get help? And then hope that they say no. And Michael Coleman isn't the only call she made. She called Bob Ross, David Castor's best friend. You heard him. Now, he didn't get that call because he was out playing golf. Is the prosecution going to tell you that Stacy knew that Bob Ross was out playing golf and wouldn't answer the phone when she called? Come on. And remember what else about Bob Ross? When Stacy was questioned, it was a big deal. Hey, you went to the Coleman's. You've never stayed away from the marital home before. You've never stayed away. Never, never, never. It's a big deal. Remember what Bob Ross said? That was the advice he gave her. It didn't come from a vacuum. It didn't come from space. It wasn't, hey, let's go over and party at the Coleman's. Bob Ross gave her that advice. David Castor's best friend gave her that advice. Now, admittedly, could Stacy have done something different over that weekend with David? Should she have noticed that something a little bit more than just intoxication was going on? Sure, maybe. But you ever hear the phrase, hindsight is 2020? Is that fair to use that hindsight to say, hey, this is what she should have done? Now, remember the context. This is the anniversary weekend, big, you know, the big dinner. And if you look at it from this perspective, if Stacy is innocent, okay, take a look at the innocent Stacy, what she would have done, what any of us would have done. We've got this big anniversary dinner. And the person that we're supposed to be spending this weekend with gets drunk. And not only drunk, they start getting obnoxious and belligerent. And what do you do? You get angry. And so when you get angry, what happens? 
You know, maybe you don't notice the things because you're angry. And she told you that whole weekend that she was angry with David for what was happening. Now, I can tell you, she probably feels an awful lot of regret about that now. But does that mean she killed him because she was angry under those circumstances? Absolutely not. Now, we heard a lot about, or on the cross-examination, some issue about Stacy was saying things from that witness stand, either when I asked her questions, when the prosecution did, about, and she was saying things, like for instance, one of the things she said was that uh, Ashley was home. One of the things she said was that she had to go to the post office. You know, so there was at that time when she wasn't home and Ashley and David were there, and the prosecution wants you to believe that's sinister, and that she's making it up as she goes along, because those things didn't show up in the 2005 statement. Well, let me just say this about that. You know, the prosecution made it sound like, hey, Stacy feels that the police are in on this big scheme to frame her. But what did she say about Detective Lashinsky? She said, Detective Lashinsky, she talked to her for, what, four and a half hours or longer? I don't even remember. I know it's more than four. And that Detective Lashinsky asked her questions, dictated it to somebody else, and then Stacy signed it because it was true. Stacy didn't say at the end of it, this is every single detail that we ever talked about she didn't say that. She just said it's true. And when she got up in that witness and she said it was true. Now I'll read you a quote that we heard at this trial. Well, not every single piece of information that she gave me would be relevant to putting in that statement. And yeah, I mean, you can't record every single word that someone says. Guess who said that? Detective Lashinsky, the person who took her statement in 2005. Let me read that again, in case you think that Stacy did something wrong or that there's something sinister about her having details today that didn't show up in that affidavit. Not every single piece of information that she gave me would be relevant to putting in the statement. And yeah, I mean, you can't record every single word someone says. If you don't believe me, ask to have it read back. Detective Lashinsky's own testimony. So when the prosecution accuses her of adding in details that didn't exist back then, they're wrong. And what did Detective Lashinsky say she was investigating? A homicide? No. She said, as far as she knew, she was a suicide. It was a suicide. She just wanted to get the details of, about a suicide. When I asked Detective Spinelli about what window he was looking at, he said he didn't have a window. He didn't know. So is any surprise that on Friday, and go look at the affidavit yourself. You've got it in evidence. Read it. Is it any surprise that there's a whole bunch of things missing about Friday? Friday is three days before David was found. And if you need proof, ironclad proof, that not everything that actually happened made its way into that affidavit, remember the testimony of Ashley Wallace herself. What did she say? She was home Friday afternoon. Read the Lashinsky statement. See if you can see anywhere in there it says that Ashley was home. Don't look too hard. It's not there. But we know it absolutely happened. So if they're going to tell you that something in that statement, because it's not there, it didn't happen, that's just not so. And look at this. Ask yourself some other questions. Take a look at the affidavit. In it, she mentions, he said, and here's another quote from the affidavit. If you don't believe me, read it yourself. He never mentioned suicide at that time. He was saying this, and I never understood what he meant. Now, come on. If you're trying to set up a phony suicide, don't you do every single thing possible to say, hey, look, suicide, 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 suicide. Stacy's given I don't know how many chances, and yet she never takes it. If you don't believe me, Let's listen to a 911 call. Again, I've got to apologize. Well, actually, you know what? Let's skip it. Let's skip it. They can listen to it. Again, we have technical difficulties with the sound. I intended to play you the 2005 911 call. I'll just ask that if you have any doubt about what I'm saying, about what Stacy said in that call, just ask to have it played. We'll make sure you can hear it. I promise.
And remember, this whole, you know, Stacy's not telling, he's talking about uh, David being suicidal applies to Ashley as well. Read her 2007 statement she gave at the hospital after Ashley was taken to the hospital. You have that in evidence. Read it. <coughs> See if she's trying to hint or say that Ashley was suicidal. In fact, it's the exact opposite. She says, hey, look, the family's under a lot of stress, which it was because of this investigation. But as far as depression or talking about hurting herself, Stacy says no. In fact, Stacy goes so far as to say that she doesn't believe Ashley killed her father, even after seeing that note. At the, so picture this. Stacy's at the hospital. Ashley's in that room being worked on. Stacy has seen that note. Detectives are questioning her about that. And when given a chance to say Ashley was suicidal, that she was talking about hurting herself, that she could have killed her father, the three things that someone in her position, if she's a murderer, would have done, she does none of them. Not one. She says, I don't even believe Ashley could have done it. Does that sound like somebody trying to frame her daughter? And again, if you don't believe me, read the affidavits. That's why they're there. <clears throat> now, a few words about the cross-examination you saw. Fitzpatrick is probably the single most impressive lawyer I have ever seen, and I've seen a few, okay? But let me just talk about a few things you saw. You saw a couple of things which I refer to as lawyer tricks. And I don't mean to say that they're bad, because you know I'm a lawyer. I use the same thing. Well, I'll call them this lawyer tactics. And one of the common tactics a lawyer does is you ask a question that you know there's no right answer to. Why do you ask that question that there's no right answer to? Because you want to force them into an answer that doesn't sound good. I'll give you an example. Mrs. Castor, isn't your daughter a psychotic monster? Is there a good answer to that question that would have satisfied any of you? No, there isn't. That's why the question was asked. Because if Stacy says, yes, my daughter is a psychotic monster, you all recoil in horror that this woman is attacking her daughter. If she says, no, she's not a psychotic monster, well, now guess what? That means Stacy's guilty. There is no right answer to it. Another example. That aggressive cross-examination. I wish I could be that skilled. I'm not. I can't do it like that. I just can't. Why was it like that? Why? Because in the end, there's only two possible responses that Stacy can have to it. She either breaks down, in which case, prosecution points at her and says, look, you know what? When I was, just a I was asking her questions and she broke down. An innocent person doesn't break down. An innocent person never breaks down. Why? Because they're innocent. Or, as in the case here, if she doesn't break down, they say, hey, look, what a cold and heartless killer she was. And you saw it from the stand. Again, it's fantastic lawyering, but it's not evidence. It doesn't mean anything. Would any of us know how we would behave on that witness stand under that cross-examination? I sure as heck don't know how I would. Now let's contrast the credibility of what Stacy told you with what Ashley told you. Ashley told you that she was given a single drink around noon in that vicinity on Thursday, and then she woke up in the hospital on Friday. Now, first off, if Ashley is lying about that drink, then we know Ashley is guilty. Period. End of story. Okay? If she's lying, because there's no other reason to lie about it other than that she tried to kill herself and she's guilty. So, what do we know? Well, we know from the experts, and they all agree that <clears throat> at 8 o'clock, some 17 hours later, Ashley's BAC is 0.14. And everybody agrees that that couldn't possibly happen 
from a single drink. It's not possible. Not only the alcohol is a problem, but if Ashley had taken enough drugs, or if Stacy had given Ashley enough drugs that day before at noon to make those levels at the hospital, Ashley probably would have been dead 10 times over long before anybody ever found it. But we know that's not true. So where does the prosecution go from here? Well, now, and the experts agree on this, we're probably going to hear that Ashley consumed the alcohol and the pills sometime around maybe 4 o'clock in the morning or so. And again, the experts, this isn't like the computer experts, which is like math, where 2 plus 2 equals 4, and with a computer you know or you don't know. With toxicology, you know, the body's handled a little bit differently, some a little more, some a little less, but they gave you a window. Suffice it to say, it's either late at night or early in the morning of Friday, whichever it be. So now, let's ask ourselves some important questions about this. How does Ashley Wallace have a bottle of vodka and at least 60 pills in her system. How do they get into her at 4 o'clock in the morning? How is that possible? And ladies and gentlemen, the answer to that question is literally the answer to this case. And the answer is a simple one. It's not possible for Stacy to have done it. Now, why do I say 60 pills? Remember Dr. Jengo? He told you that, based upon his analysis, the absolute bare minimum number of pills that Ashley Wallace would have had to consume to get to those levels was 60. Now, back to the old fashioned one. 60 pills a conservative estimate. And he told you that it's probably more. And I submit to you that maybe it's a lot more. So let's take a look at this. We know that a bottle of Lexapro was found near Ashley and the script was for 90 pills. And we know it was empty. So that's 90. We know there's an amoxicillin bottle with a prescription for 29 left. It's 11. We know there was an empty hydrocodone bottle. That script was for 24. We know there was an empty Ritalin bottle that was recently refilled. Ashley's own pills, 30. We know that there was a bottle of Ambien, 30 pills as well, empty. Now, I'm not saying this is exact, or this is the actual number of pills. And this isn't even all the medications they found. But take a look at this. Look at this number. And that is probably still a conservative number. 185 pills. Now I ask you this. How do you get a bottle of vodka and 185 pills into somebody while they're asleep, involuntarily? How do you do it? There's a simple answer. You can't. But let's, let, let's try to think. Let's try to think outside the box a little bit. Let's imagine that Ashley's telling the truth about what happened earlier in the day with her mother giving her that drink. And let's imagine that Stacy knocked her out with that drink. Well, I suppose the first question comes to mind is this. If she's awake and she's willing to drink whatever Stacy's going to give her, why doesn't Stacy give her the, poison, the, the, the real drink at noon? when nobody's home except the two of them, when nobody's there to rescue Ashley. Why not? Why wouldn't she do it? Why would she give her this, I don't know what you call it, this, this, this half drink, this little drink, this, this knockout drink? Why would you give her the knockout drink and then wait, what, 15 hours later, 14 hours later, before giving her this one? And by the way, remember, this number, this number had to be somewhere between here and here or more that's 4 o'clock, period, end of story. That doesn't mean, so if we're talking about 
new in the day before, that means there's a lot more. These numbers are for 4 o'clock. So again, why does Stacy not give her the real drink at noon when Ashley's willing to drink whatever she says? The answer is because she didn't give her a drink. But let's, but let's keep going. Let's keep going. So Ashley's knocked out. Okay. Now, we heard a whole lot about this whole thing about drooling. Was she drooling normally, Mrs. Castor? We heard about that. <clears throat> it's a figure of speech. And if you don't believe me, if you don't believe her, believe Bree Wallace, who also looked in on Ashley later on in the day. And you think that if Ashley was in a great deal of distress and there's something wrong with her, that Bree wouldn't have done something? You're kidding me. So this whole, was she drooling normally thing? Yet again, another red herring. Because Bree Wallace looked in on her too. And Bree didn't see anything wrong. Maybe we should ask Bree if she was drooling normally. But let's get back to this theory, or theories. So let's assume that Ashley's knocked out. So Stacy's plan, I guess, is to wait 14 hours. Which, by the way, 14 hours, you know, the knockout doesn't wear off after 14 hours. But she waits 14 hours and then manages to slip into Ashley's room undetected by anybody else in that house. And then somehow get a bottle of vodka and somewhere between 60 and 185 or more pills into her body while she's knocked out. And remember what Dr. Stork, the prosecution's expert, said. That if she, was, if she had been drugged earlier in the day, she would be knocked out. Not capable of being roused. She would be asleep. She could not be woken up. So how do you get a sleeping person to drink a bottle of vodka and chew and consume 185 pills? I'm almost embarrassed asking the question. So what does Stacy do? Does she sneak into the room and wake Ashley up and say, hey, Ashley, do me a favor. I know you'll drink anything I give you and you'll eat anything I give you. Here, do me a favor and drink this bottle of vodka. Here's a bucket, a bucket of pills. Eat them up. And then Ashley just says, OK, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, Mom. You know what you're doing. There you go. No. I mean, look at how complicated this is getting. It's so complicated, I'm having trouble keeping it in my mind. And by the way, what I say is an evidence. And what they say is an evidence. It's not proof of anything. And guess what we never heard proof of? Not one expert got up on that witness stand and opined or told you how Stacy did it. Nobody did. And so, that does, so no matter what I say, no matter what they say, there has been not one shred of evidence as to how Stacy did it or could have done it. But hey, you know what? Let's keep thinking outside the box. Turkey baster. Maybe she did it with a turkey baster. Well, we already know that doesn't work. Why? Because the author of the note tells us a turkey baster doesn't work. And can you picture that scene? Rather than giving her the poison drink at noon the day before when they're all alone, Stacy waits 14 hours, gets a turkey baster, and starts plunging out of the absolute bottle into Ashley and shooting pills at her. I mean, does that make any sense at all? I mean, I feel embarrassed almost, I'm mean, almost embarrassed saying it to you. But let's keep going. Hey, listen. A feeding tube, maybe. Well, Dr. Olson, the ER doctor, I asked about feeding tubes, remember? And he said, you have to have medical training to do one of those. Because there's two pipes in there. But let's give Stacy some credit. I mean, hey, she was a secretary for an ambulance company. I'm sure right after they showed her how to work the phones, they went right to feeding tubes. And can you imagine this scene? Stacy waits 14 hours and then somehow mixes up this concoction of pills and vodka, gets some kind of, I don't know, an IV bag with a tube and starts intubating her daughter over the course of the night without her daughter waking up and nobody seeing it. And literally, what, an hour or two hours later, the police are all over that house 
and they don't find a single thing that shows she used a feeding tube? I mean, literally, what's next? Magic? Because you know what? I believe magic a little bit more than I believe some of these things I'm telling you right now. The bottom line is this. It's simple. There is no other reasonable or possible explanation for how those pills and that vodka got into Ashley Wallace other than she took them. It is the easiest, the most obvious, and the most simple explanation of all. She took them. And if you're still wondering about Ashley's credibility after all this, let's take a look at what happens in the two days before she ends up at the hospital. Start on Wednesday. That's the Smirnoff watermelon night, right? Ashley says her mother gives her a Smirnoff watermelon in this giant 24-ounce cup. And it tastes bad. And not just bad, so bad that she's choking on it and she's gagging on it and she can't get it down. Now again, she's not a five-year-old, she's not an infant, she's 20. But let's assume for the sake of argument that yeah, she chokes this horrible drink down. Does she do what everybody else in the world would do? Say, ugh, that's it for me, smearing off watermelon apparently is not my drink. No, she goes back to the fridge and she keeps drinking them. Does that make any sense at all? I'd love to ask Detective Spinelli about what he thinks about that. Does that make any sense? I know what I do is when I drink something that tastes horrible and rancid, I run back to the fridge and I get more. But that's what Ashley Wallace did. And then, let's talk about how many she had. Her and I went back and forth, if you recall. And again, you can have the testimony read back. We went back and forth. But how many did you have? How many did you have? I said, hey, you told the grand jury this. You told us that. You're telling me this now. We're in all this math. The judges even said it was making him thirsty. But the bottom line is this. After all of that, I asked her a couple of simple questions. One, how many were in it when it started? Six, how many were in it when you were done? None. And I asked her, hey, when your grand jury testimony, when asked how many more you had, didn't you tell Ms. Garvey the rest of them? Well, I hate to tell you this, but six is the rest of them. And remember the testimony from everybody else, even her sister and her boyfriend. No one else was drinking Smirnoff watermelon. The only person who had anything else was Bree, and she had that little half, she said. So here's Ashley downing this entire six-pack except that small half. And why is that important? Because she gets sick. The prosecution wants you to believe she gets sick because Stacy's trying to poison her. But she got sick because she downed a six pack of Smirnoff watermelon in three hours. That's why. Well, let's keep going. After this, Ashley tells you all about her mom trying to slip her some more pills before going to bed. First of all, if you remember, if you have it read back, Ashley can't keep it straight. First it's a round pill, then it's a long pill. It's a hydrocodone. Wait, no, it's a Motrin. Wait, no, it's Tylenol with codeine. Which, by the way, remember she testified, she's very familiar with all of them. She can't keep it straight. But she did keep one thing straight, if you remember, Ambien. My mom gave me an Ambien. And then she came back and gave me one and a half Ambien. I said, Ashley, what do you mean Ambien? Describe it. And what did she describe it as? Oh, the little pink pill. Well, what a coincidence. We've all heard the ads, Ambien, the little pink pill. Except there's a little problem with that story. And you heard about it from Dr. Django. Stacy's prescription for Ambien was 10 milligrams. And 10 milligram Ambien's are white. They are not pink. They are not pink. Ashley is lying. She is making up a story. And by the way, not a very good one. <clears throat> Let's move on to Thursday. 
Ashley tells us her mom wants her to celebrate her 21st birthday for her mom spends the huh, rest of her life in prison. Well, that was a good story, except it never happened. And here we go again with the terrible drinks. I mean, that Smirnoff watermelon was so bad it gagged, but she described this one as even worse, far worse. And yet, what does she do? She drinks the drink, not just a sip. She doesn't just go, just have a little sip and say, well, you know, I'm going to kind of nurse this along until I get a chance to get rid of it. No, she drinks the whole thing. And she concocts this wild story about a straw, and her mom says, count to 10 and all this baloney. Are you kidding me? If there's 185 pills, or even 60 pills, or 50 pills in that drink, how is it possible that somebody doesn't notice it? Where's that giant paste of sludge at the bottom of it? How do you dissolve 100, 200, 60, 40, pick your number, pills in a drink full of ice? You can't. It's simple. Stacy didn't give her that drink. And remember, something interesting Stacy had said on the witness stand, and it was kind of an offhand comment. I didn't even really ask the question. She mentioned something about Ashley's room being a mess. You remember that? Well, apparently, Ashley, can't eat, her mom can't even get her to clean her room. You think that someone can't, you know, can't get Ashley to clean her room can get her daughter to drink this horrifying drink, this awful, terrible drink? It's just not possible. I mean, think about yourselves. I mean, think about what you would do in that situation. Would you drink it? Do you think you could get your kids to drink it? Come on. Here's another important point. Ashley testifies that she found out from her mother that Michael Wallace was exhumed and that antifreeze was in his body on Friday, the 7th. And I asked her this a couple times, because frankly I was surprised she said it. And why is that important? Well, the 7th was the first time the detectives interviewed Stacy. But remember what the detectives didn't tell you they told to Stacy. Stacy didn't know Michael Wallace had been exhumed or there was antifreeze in him on the 7th. Listen to what the detectives said. Did they ever say they told her? No, because they didn't. Stacy didn't know until the 11th. But Ashley apparently knew that there was antifreeze in Michael Wallace on the 7th. How could she know that unless she put it there? And here's another point. Suicide. Up until the time she took that witness stand, I don't know how many times she was asked about suicide. I don't know. But I can assume that at the hospital they did a psych exam on her and asked her about it. I asked all the detectives about whether she'd ever mentioned it before. Have you ever, suicide, suicide, have you ever been suicidal? Have you ever tried to commit suicide? Why? Because that's an important detail here. And the only time she ever told the truth about it was on this witness stand when she knew that I had her letters and her ex-boyfriend ready to go. But what does she do? She does what Ashley always tries to do. She tries to minimize it. Oh, no. I wrote it in those letters and I talked about it, but I really wasn't going to do it. You read those letters. They're in evidence. You tell me whether or not they sound like somebody just thinking about it or whether it's somebody really contemplating or somebody right on the edge of doing it. And you heard from her ex-boyfriend, Mike Wazlewski. What acts does he have to grind? He's got none. He said that not only was she talking about suicide based upon what happened with her father, but that at the time David Castor was alive, things were so bad with him that she was talking about killing herself, and one of the reasons was because it was going on at home with David. Now, do I know what was going on at home at da with David that was so bad that a person would contemplate killing themselves? I wish I did, but I don't. And you know why you don't? Because the police never looked into it. They didn't ask Ashley, and they didn't follow up. Now remember, she gets up there and tells you, oh, my relationship with David was getting better. What a coincidence. They, now the prosecution wants to talk about Stacy trying to lay the foundation for a story. Here's the foundation for a story. David and I don't get along at all. We have these fights. But all of a sudden, as, as he's coming up on the weekend he dies, suddenly the relationship's getting better. Well, you heard from Ashley's grandmother. And what did she say? She 
she said that the relationship didn't get better at all. It didn't change at all right up until the time David died. Why would her grandmother come in and lie about it? Why? Answer, grandmother wouldn't. And by the way, what a turnaround. A few months earlier, it's so bad she's going to kill herself. It's so bad. And now, a couple months later, everything's OK. Hey, we actually get along now. What a turnaround. Here's another interesting point, a very important one. Ashley says that on Friday before David died, she gets home at 3.30 or so, and she had to work at 4. She said it. She had to work at 4. Now, the prosecution knows that's a problem. And if you read the transcript or you have it read back, you'll see where they try to sort of rehabilitate, try to fuzz that number over with her. But nope. When I ask her later on, when did you have to be at work? She says, four. Why is that important? Because of her work records. Her work records say she punched in at 1659. 459. Not 359. 459. Why is that so important? Ashley works five minutes away from the house. She says she was only home for a few minutes while she grabbed her stuff and left. What was she doing for that extra hour or more? While well, she was home alone with David. Where is that hour? Where is that unaccounted for hour? I'd love to. Have, I'd love to ask Detective Spinelli if he thought that discrepancy was important. That all of a sudden, literally, at the time that the prosecution's own witnesses say is most likely David was poisoned, Ashley suddenly can't account for an hour of her time. And not only that, but she tries to minimize it. I was only home for a few minutes. I never saw David. Are you kidding me? You'll see the pictures of, these, of this house. It was tiny. Ashley herself said she could hear from her basement you know, room, she could hear everything in the house. And she, couldn't, she doesn't know if David was home. Are you kidding me? Ashley had the opportunity to murder David Castor. That's what this comes down to. The whole David Castor case comes down to opportunity. And Ashley had it just as much as Stacy did. Is the prosecution going to claim that those work records are wrong? I don't think so. They put them in evidence. But I can assure you this, if they hadn't, I would have. Ashley all minimizes everything that gets her in trouble. How often did you fight with David? Not very often. That's what she said. Have it read back. Not very often. Except she wanted to kill herself. It was so bad. How long were you home on Friday? Yeah, just long enough to grab my stuff and leave, 15 to 20 minutes. Except the work records prove she's lying. Did it bother you that your sister was daddy's favorite little princess? Nope. Are you kidding me? How often did you get spanked? Not more than three times. And yet her own grandmother comes in here and says that grandma had arguments with Michael because of the harsh discipline he used to put on Ashley. The prosecution will tell you, hey, ignore all of it. Look, the bottom line is this. Stacy didn't murder her husband. She didn't try to murder her daughter and frame her for it. Stacy Castor is not guilty. We talked about circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence, these theories. Well, guess what? I've talked about a whole lot of theories. And the fact of the matter is, is that if you find any of the theories that I have put forth to you credible about how Ashley pulled this off or why Stacy did not, the judge will tell you you cannot find her guilty. It's as simple as that. I am not the judge. Don't take my word for it. When Judge Fahey tells you about the law, listen carefully about circumstantial evidence. It means that the prosecution not only has to prove their theory beyond all reasonable doubt, but they have to disprove everything, everything I have said to you beyond all reasonable doubt. 
Have they done that? I submit to you that no, they have not. Did they prove that Ashley could not possibly have murdered David on Friday? No. Did they prove that it's not possible that Ashley could have taken those pills and drank that vodka? No. When you go back to deliberate, I want you to do something for me. Maybe I've already asked you this. Take each piece of this case and ask yourself, if Stacy's guilty, why did she do this? And you'll see the answer is, geez, I don't know. And as soon as you get that answer, that's it. For her to literally have pulled off these two crimes, I mean, she would have literally had the most complicated, convoluted scheme in the world. And, and not just complicated, but she would have had to literally have pulled, I don't know how many rabbits out of a hat with luck over what happened. Oh, Mike Coleman shows up. She asks, hey, should we get him some help? And just out of luck, Mike Coleman says, no, leave him there. Leave him in bed. He'll sleep it off. Wow, that's lucky if she's the killer. Look, <clears throat> there's a principle out there that's called Occam's Razor. It's a, fancy word, it's a fancy thing for saying, look, the simplest answer is usually, almost always, the truth. And in this case, the simplest answer of all is that Stacy Castor did not murder David. The simplest answer is that Stacy did not try to kill her daughter and frame her for it. That is the simplest answer. No matter how you labor over this case, no matter how much time you put into it, and I'll ask you, take your time. Read everything you want to read. Those tapes that we couldn't play for you because the audio is off. Ask to have them played. I'll send our laptop back there and you can play it yourself. Look at all of it. Look at everything. No matter how much you labor over it, no matter how much you don't want to believe a 12-year-old is capable of doing this, all you can do is take a guess. There are only two people on this whole planet who actually know what happened. Everybody else is taking a guess. And you cannot guess whether or not somebody is guilty of murder. You can't take somebody's life away because of a guess. You have to know it. You have to know it beyond all reasonable doubt. I thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you both.